I get so far into the heads of the killers and the victims. You haven't gone there long. Don't you tell me where I am. You put them in your head. I guess it would be impossible to do a show that pays homage to Seven without also paying homage to that film's influences. Namely, the Thomas Harris-inspired films Manhunter and Silence of the Lambs. Since Frank Black's innate ability to see what the killer sees largely mirrors the skills of Manhunter's Will Graham, the writers have to deal with the consequences of that power. Jordan goes missing from a princess party that is haunted by a creepy clown. Inside the house, she sees Frank descending an infinite spiral staircase to what looks like hell. The disfigured clown calls out to her and she rightly screams herself awake. This is the first indication we get that Jordan may have inherited some of Frank's abilities. Although at this point, we're not sure if Frank's job is just leaking into the lives and minds of his family. Given the show's apocalyptic and religious imagery, the spiral staircase leads me to think of Dante's descent into hell as he chronicles humankind's sins. The parallels to Frank Black should be obvious here, hence why he's descending the stairs. We get one of those Joss whedon -y moments where the character asks a question and it gets answered by an action. Everybody has bad dreams. Why? And there's the audience's answer. It's a great way to pull the audience from one scene to the next and give them all the context they need to interpret that scene. It's a subtle trick, but it's sometimes the difference between a show where A happens, then B happens, then C happens, or a show where A leads to B leads to C. Trust me, you feel the difference. The Portland PD has called in the group to consult on the murder of a woman who was cut in half and left in an animal shelter. Frank takes a cursory look at the scene and tells the cops they will find a message on the body. Jim Pinsears, who is a veteran of the Millennium Group, tells Frank the group is not convinced this is the work of a serial killer. And here's another example of the Millennium Rider's occasional clunky dialogue, as Pinsiers says some in the group want to use the Holmes criteria, and then explains to Frank what that is. Others think we should wait. Applying the Holmes criteria, defining serial killers involving three victims with a time period between murders of at least 30 days. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. Obviously, this is Pinsiers telling the audience what the Holmes criteria are, because Frank, a former FBI profiler, wouldn't need it explained to him. It would be like Pinsiers using the term FBI and then stopping to clarify, that's the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It just comes across like the writers are trying to impress us with their research. Pinsiers wants Frank to work with the provisional recruit, Jim Horn, played by 24's James Morrison. Horn is a sharp behavioral specialist, but he's distracted by his divorce. And he's really going through it, as the kids say. Phone company. Man. Warren is skeptical of Frank's special skills, but he also gets a lot of things wrong, so what does he know? Divorce, maybe. He's never married, never had sex. I read those remains as a signature of his hatred for women. The defecation was covered, he was embarrassed by it. A second victim is found at the dead letters office, and this time Frank finds a message on the body right away. Hair today. As in... Hair today, gone tomorrow. Great, we have the dad joke killer. Warren speculates that the killer is connected to the victims by their hair, but his son bursts into the office to surprise him, breaking his train of thought. We meet Jim's ex-wife, who comes across like a harpy in the 30 seconds that we see her. Damn it. You know how I feel about him ever seeing those. She chastises Jim for looking at crime scene photos in his own office and allowing their son to see them, even though she sent him in to surprise Jim in the first place. You know, writers Glenn Morgan and James Wong might have been going through some things themselves because Jim's wife is almost cartoonishly shrewish. The killer claims a third victim, this time Silence of the Lambs style, complete with scamming the victim into a van. Frank thinks they can lure the killer out by taunting him with a planted story, but a frustrated horn jumps the gun and attacks an innocent man. Frank finally calls Jim out for his big divorce dad energy, telling him there's a difference between getting inside the killer's head and letting them inside yours. And there's your thesis for the episode. They trace the killer's path to an eyeglass place where the technician remembers him freaking out about having to take a number. This is consistent with Frank's theory that the killer is upset about the dehumanizing effects of the world. That's why one victim was dumped into an animal shelter and another in the dead letter office with the rest of the disposables. Man, wait until this guy gets a load of the internet. Horn excuses himself from the stakeout that the PD has planned and instead sets his own trap for the killer, trapping him and assaulting him in his own van. Frank eventually pulls him off, but not before Jim has nearly destroyed their case by making the van inadmissible. Fortunately, there's enough evidence to tie the killer to the victims. 
but Jim is a washout as far as the group is concerned. And to tie it in with the opening, Jim asks Frank why he continues to chase these monsters when it takes such a toll. And we're out! Dead Letters is the first episode of the series not directed by David Nutter, and you can see a decidedly different tone in the episode. Director Thomas J. Wright is a longtime visual artist, having created the paintings for the classic Rod Serling anthology, Night Gallery. His knack for surreal and horrifying visuals comes in handy here, with the nightmarish vision that opens the show, and the serial killer's handiwork, which was so gruesome that Lance Henriksen actually asked to be excused on multiple occasions. As a matter of fact, Wright would go on to be the series' most prolific director, humming over a third of the episodes. While Gehenna opened with a line from W.H. Auden, Dead Letters is the first to open with a Bible verse, Job 3, 25-26, which details Job's despair at life after having lost his family and his wealth. Phone company. Man. In the Bible, Job's worst fears are realized, and he finds that he can't recover. Obviously, this gives us context on Jim Horn's story, as he struggles to adjust to the divorced dad life and doesn't deal with his own rage. Unlike Job, Jim gives in to his anger and it nearly costs him and the group everything. But because Jim acts as a sort of road not traveled, or at least road not traveled yet for Frank, the verse is also a warning. Horn is a cautionary tale for Frank, and a good one is played by James Morrison. Morrison is a longtime character actor who frequently plays law enforcement characters. His biggest role is probably Bill Buchanan on Fox's 24. Here, he's clearly an analog for William Peterson's Will Graham character from Manhunter. He even looks like Peterson with the beard. In that film, Graham has to walk the line as he thinks like a deranged killer, but also thinks like a family man. I see you there. And I see me desired by you. It's Horn's inability to compartmentalize that inevitably knocks him out of the game and it illustrates the line that Frank Black constantly has to walk. But in this episode, at least, Frank is able to use his family to motivate him for good, while Horn becomes fueled by fear and anger. After two episodes focused on apocalyptic lore, Dead Letters is a welcome shift to the run-of-the-mill serial killers and their motivations concept that the series was marketed as. The great interplay between Henriksen and Morrison makes for an interesting episode that gives us more insight into Frank's mental state and some of the internal politics of the group. We'll merge the lore with the Serial Killer of the Week next episode.